I'm really excited to show you what PNSO has for us today. Why do I have dinosaurs on the brain? The non-dinosaurs from this very first dinosaur book I read as a child have been seared indelibly into my memory, including these armored fish. And as a close relative of Dinichthys, the better known Dunkleosteus is what we're looking at today. For most people, their exposure to this nightmarish fish might have come from this. Here's a Dunkleosteus farmer on the head there, over two inches thick, sharp shears sticking out. And what they do is they slice them together just like scissors working. And when you look at that frightening visage and those powerful shears, it definitely makes an impression. I have this beautiful model from Safari, an example of how you can get both a great sculpt and paint tabs in a mainstream model. But now we look at Zaha, the Dunkleosteus, which brings some updates to the look. Now, disclaimer, I know very little about prehistoric fish, so I welcome any corrections or additions from the paleoichthyologists out there. Still, let me share with you the little I know. The placoderms are a class of armored fish, and Dunkleosteus belongs to the Arthrodiran order, which had movable joints between the cephalic and thoracic armor. As I'll explain later when we look at the body plan, we have very few postcranial remains. Now, this model measures 23 centimeters or 9 inches, and using the high estimate of 8.8 .8 meters or 28.9 feet, for the type specimen Dunkleosteus teruli, the scale is 1 to 38. And for 1 to 35, you're looking at 8 meters or 26 feet, which I think is within reason. Now, there's absolutely no mistaking that characteristic head. You see the skull, the thoracic shield. the jaw cusps here. And the plates are wonderfully defined. The colour is generally silver with these dark mottlings, happily acknowledging the presence of overlying skin. I really like this fade here in the jaw. Uh, and the dentition, surely the main feature with the anterior and lateral superior natals, an inferior natal sharply defined, and they look absolutely forbidding and sinister. The jaw articulates, and I have to tell you, I'm over the moon with what PNSO has done here. Let me explain. The jaw mechanics of Dunkleosteus are really fascinating. Anderson and Westmead in 2007 published a paper in which they developed a computer model to simulate the skull motions as well as the bite forces, and it's a really exciting read. I suggest you go read that paper. But here's a brief idea. Now first, understand that the skull is really kinetic. Between the skull and the thoracic shield, you have the cranial thoracic joint. And between the skull and the inferior natal or the lower jaw, you have the quadratal mandibular joint. Then you have the jaw depressor muscle, the coracomandibularis, inserting on the jaw uh, from its origin on the scapulocoracoid. Collectively, this forms a four bar linkage system. The thoracic shield acts as a fixed link while the others rotate. So you have the coracomandibularis muscle. And another muscle, the epixialis, spans the nuchal gap here. And I think you can see how when these two muscles contract, they cause a pulling force that opens the mouth. Now, what do we have here? Well, crazy PNSO has done exactly that. Here, there's one joint, which approximates the craniothoracic joint. Here, another that approximates the quadratomandibular joint. Then here are the pivot points marking the origin and insertion of the coracomandibularis. So when I pull on this here, the thoracic shield is the fixed link and the others rotate. Now you know I'm just over the moon with this. 
uh, when I saw the release images, I thought there was one articulation, and because of this gap here, a simulation of the craniothoracic articulation. I would never have dreamt PNSO would actually do this four bar linkage system. You did it. You crazy son of a bitch, you did. Now we saw how the PNSO helicoprion helped us visualize how that bus saw might have worked. And here again, PNSO has given us another study on that. There are of course many accessory muscles, but in short, the resultant vectors of the various muscles working together results in a jaw that opens when the skull rotates upward and pulls the jaw forward. And when closed, rotate the skull downward and pushes the jaw rearward. The cranial rotation drives the lower jaw rotation at three times the speed. So opening with very high speed that creates a suction feeding effect and closing with very high bite forces. And these forces are focused into a very small area, the fang tip at the edge. Allowing it to puncture and crush bones and armor borne by many fish at this time. I just can't help playing with this. Now we do wish that this exposed area here was painted the same because uh, it makes it look like gills and the correct location for the gills is actually more inferior, um, just behind the inferior natal here, as you see in this paleo zoom model. So I'll just imagine that this is muscle. Now moving down is the body. Again, I love the paint application. When I saw the release images, I thought how beautiful it was, but I also wondered how far off the actual would be. Now as you can see, it does lose some complexity. But you have the general shine. I love the salmon skin patterning and counter shading. And continues into the whole animal as a total skin. I'm glad the skin is smooth because although some dermal ornamentation has been found, uh, you can see from the one centimeter scale bar, it would be invisible at this one to 35 scale. Now, if you're an old timer like me, you're probably used to a different shape like this. And indeed, this PNSO is an update to that. You see, post-cranial remains for Dunkleosteus are very poor. And in cases like this, and as I explained in my Cacarodontosaurus reviews, one way is to make phylogenetic inferences, borrowing from related genera to fill those gaps. For Dunkleosteus, something like a costius, and that's how the body's traditionally been reconstructed essentially a scaled-up Cacosteus. But Cacosteus was a freshwater fish, while evidence points to Dunkleosteus being pelagic, meaning living in open waters. So another way is to make eco-morphological inferences. Animal morphology is also influenced by habitat, feeding niche and function, and in this case, swimming mode. So unrelated animals convergently evolve similar bowel plants. Ferran et al. in 2017 did justice for Don Cleosteus. They analyzed the relationship between locomotory patterns and the tail fins of extended pelagic sharks, as well as the relationship between total body length and upper jaw perimeter. They arrived at something like this, a narrow peduncle, a wide spanning caudal fin, and for the specimen studied, estimated lengths of 3.2 to 8.9 meters or 10.5 to 29 feet. And I think you can see that, uh, except for the dorsal fin being a little more posterior, the general finnage agrees with this paper, at least to my untrained eyes. I wish this was a little less sinuous, but at least it's not so in the transverse plane, so it doesn't suggest anguilliform motion, but carangiform motion. To end off, let's compare it to the Safari Limited Dunkleosteus.
and of course the Pianesso Helicoprion, which also falls in the 1 to 35 scale. Now I think you can see the same pleasing sheen and then of course the working mouth articulation. So that's it for the Pianesso Dunkleosteus. Again, I don't know much about prehistoric fish, but as a casual layman, I'm very happy with not just a close update of body form, but with a working jaw articulation that captures the idea from Anderson and Westmead so visually. With a beautiful paint application and scaling well with my other Pianesso marine animals. So that's it for now, guys. You have a great week ahead.